Hi, welcome to Conversations with me, Karen Van Horen, a fashion historian and curator. My guest today is Dr. Jonathan Square, a social historian who studies and educates on fashion and slavery. In our conversation, he told me about his shift from social history into fashion history and how that led him to start an online project, Fashioning the Self in Slavery and Freedom. We also talked about um, the workshops, Fashion and Justice, that he conducts with fashion historian Kimberly Jenkins, in which they really expand the conversations on a more sustainable, humane fashion industry and make it accessible to a wider audience. Hi, Jonathan. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. So we'll start, I'll just ask you to um, say who you are and what you do. Great, well, first off, I just wanna thank you for inviting me. You know, I always love chatting with you. I feel like we could chat for hours, but I'm gonna try to be pithy (laughs) for the sake of this video. Um, But my name is Jonathan Square. Uh, I am a fashion scholar who is based in Brooklyn, New York, and I go by he, him, his pronouns. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but I've lived in New York for about 11 years. I teach full-time at Harvard University, and I also run, and I've also founded and run the Digital Humanities Project, Fashioning the Self in Slavery and Freedom. And so I think before we kind of talk about, um, before I'll ask you some question about your digital humanities project, which we'll, we'll get to, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up now is because this is sort of how I was introduced to you. And so we've kind of met socially and I knew who you are. And when I started teaching at FIT, um, I taught textile, the history of textile trade and technology. And my background, as you know, is in fashion history, it's in fashion design. And um, although I obviously knew a lot about textiles, um, when I needed to teach textiles, I found uh, there were a lot of holes in my knowledge. And when I got to the 19th century and I needed to talk about the cotton trade, I was horrified by how little I knew. And so then I got in touch with you and asked you to come um, into the classroom and speak with the students. And this is really how I was introduced into your academic work, um, which is really interesting. And it was really fascinating to see the students who, you know, before that had their phones on their laps and they were like texting the whole time and then when you got there everyone were like sitting (laughs) upright (laughs) listening taking notes um and i to me it really spoke to um the kind of scholarship that you do but also how rare and important it is so i really wanted to start with you just talking a little bit about your academic background um and the kind of research that you you done and you continue to do. Absolutely. So I didn't start off as a fashion scholar, believe it or not. Um, that always shocks some of my friends. I thought of myself as being a social historian. So I did. We're actually. I'm an alum of Karen's program, actually. <laughs> so we we we're right. both getting Pete. I have a PhD in history, and Karen is doing a PhD in history, and right. we both did at NYU. Yeah, I started the program at NYU thinking of myself as a social historian or a scholar of slavery. And then over the course of being in New York City and as my interests and in research developed, I became a fashion scholar. So my dissertation is actually on a prison that was built in Rio de Janeiro in the 19th century. <laughs> a very esoteric topic. <laughs> but <laughs> in the dissertation, I did a, there was a chapter on mugshots and how prisoners in this this um carceral facility were styling styling themselves in these mugshots and my dissertation committee really loved that chapter 
And they were like, why aren't you doing more of this kind of work? You're obviously very passionate about it. Um, this is the best chapter in the dissertation. So I started leaning into that work more. And then another friend of mine who's a professor at Hunter College um, invited me to design a course um, for his department. And he's like, you should do a chapter on fashion and slavery. Like this is, this is you know, like developing research. You should design a course around this. And I did. And the course was canceled because of low enrollment. But one thing I did in preparation for the course is that I set up a Facebook page with the idea that students would be able to contribute and like engage with the course material outside of the classroom. So engaging using social media. And when the course was canceled, I was like, well, I've done all this preparation. I have this Facebook page. I'm just going to teach the course anyway. To and everyone. I just started, it's everyone, exactly. <laughs> and I just started posting images and videos and articles that I had pulled in preparation for the course. And that's how Fashioning the Self and Slavery and Freedom began. It actually, that was the name of the course. Um, and it became, rather than being a course, it became a digital humanities project. And it was sort of the, the birth of this project. That's incredible. I really didn't know the history of how it started. Um, and, you know, one of the, and before we get into that, one of the interesting things that I remember from you coming into my classroom is that you talked uh, in a lot of details about the textiles and um, what it felt to wear some of those textiles. And I think that slaves uh, produced and wore themselves. And um, I think for students who or not used to thinking about the human experience uh, that are thinking about textiles in very sort of like technical and mechanical um, framework. It was really interesting to think, oh, they not just produce those things, they also were wearers of, the, of those products and what it felt like in, um, and I think this is what makes your work really strong is that you kind of bring all of those things together. You really emphasize um, the human experience. So I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that aspect of your work. Absolutely. I think that's where, you know, my social historian training comes in. And, uh, you know, one thing that I always do in my fashion and slavery course is that I actually bring in swatches of fabric um, that were the types of fabrics that were worn by enslaved people in an effort to get students to have a tactile experience mm -hmm. of wearing some of the fabrics that enslaved people wore. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and, you know, it's people think about the manufacturing of like textiles and cottons and, and things like that, but they don't think about the experience. Um, and I think that's essential because fashion is essentially, it's a commodity and it's a product, but it's something that you actually put on your body and engage with the world in. Um, so it's important to think about the experience of these garments and these clo clothing worn by enslaved people. So it's something I try to emphasize in my pedagogy and it's something also I'm working to incorporate into my scholarship. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things for me, finding your digital humanities project, Fashioning the Self, really transformed um, my own approach to thinking about fashion um, and understanding like American fashion. Um, and, you know, I think this idea of like visuals and representation and how incorporating visuals into academic training um, could really not just change the content and the kind of conversations that you're having in the classroom, but also how students engage and how students may be seeing themselves um, or are triggered to think about their own histories, their family histories, their own connection um to history and i'm sure one thing that you've encountered you know in academia and it's something i've certainly encountered is that the visual is always sidelined there's an overemphasis on 
textual mm -hmm. objects or texts or books or articles, and there's not much emphasis given on objects or material culture or fashion. And I think that goes back to just intellectual biases, like, you know, right. academia is, is about the life of the mind and, you know, objects, fashion, craft is more base. People have respect for it, but they don't put it on the same level as say like mm -hmm. philosophical thought or economic theory. Um, and, it, and one of the things in my work that I try to do is like try to like put them on equal footing um, because there's a lot of actual, there's one, there's a lot of intellectual work in fashion and in the making of fashion, um, but there's also a lot of political content embedded in the things that we wear. You just have to use a different type of analysis to get at it. Right. So you do use your, those images as texts, essentially. Exactly. And I also read garments as texts. Like often, I say this ad nauseum, and if anyone who's watching this um, has seen me speak before, you, you've probably heard this before, so I apologize, but texts and textiles have the same Latin root. So right. you, the way you can analyze a, t a text, you can do with a textile or a garment. So can you explain how you approach that? How do you read a garment or a textile? Exactly. So, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't have access to the actual garment, particularly like the garments worn by enslaved people. Literally, the, the number of surviving garments worn by enslaved people, I can probably count. It's probably like 50-something garments that I can, like, mm -hmm. off the top of my head. There aren't a lot around. So I depend a lot on photographs and also textual descriptions of what enslaved people wore. And also, of course, art, mm -hmm. um, paintings and drawings and things like that. So it, it requires you to just really sit with pieces to really visually break down what the person is wearing, look at their face. Um, do they look comfortable in what they're wearing? Um, how are they wearing it? How are they styling it? Is there a pattern across images where you see the th same thing over and over again? For example, I have a chapter on um, head wraps mm -hmm. worn by free and enslaved women in New Orleans. And uh, you just see this over and over again in like 19th century portraiture of free women of color, the way they're styling their head wraps. So it just requires you to sort of sit with pieces much longer than you would normally to like Pick, up, pick apart small details here and there. Mm -hmm. And compare. Uh, compare. Images and, yeah. and so when, so you started this Facebook page, you uploaded pictures. How, how has your work on that project evolved since? Oh my gosh, in so many ways, in ways that I couldn't even have imagined. Um, I just thought it would be a cute little project that I do, like a little side thing that I was doing, but it, it's actually become like my main work mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And a lot of people know me as a scholar through this project. And it's something I would actually encourage all scholars to do, to have a part of themselves that's more public facing, whether it's like you with a YouTube channel or an Instagram account or a Facebook account. I just think it's really, it's a great way to radicalize higher education because mm -hmm. You and I both know that there's, you know, repositories and databases that are only accessible if you have an institutional affiliation. Right. So I really love the idea of making knowledge accessible to anyone who might be interested in it, whether it's in social media is a great platform mm -hmm. for that. Um, but because I've, I've been so visible in the work that I'm doing, like I literally post on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so people just know of me. And for that reason, I've, I've been tapped for a number of um, public facing talks and events. So this image, for example, is from um, a conference that I organized at the Weeksville Heritage Center. And it was a conference that was essentially inspired by fashioning the self and slavery and freedom. In fact, as you can see, it's essentially the same name, except mm -hmm. um, include the black body. Um, so I've, I've, I've organized conferences. Um, I, there's a, a magazine that I've been able to um, 
create that's inspired by the project. So it's 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 taken taken on a life of its own in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that work that you sort of like started putting out images and I've really kind of seen your work involved and even the depth and level of your analysis have seen, I've seen it really sort of like mature um, in, a, in a really fascinating way. And I think, I think when, when I met you, I don't think you then, um, Defined yourself as a fashion historian, so I'm I'm really like happy to see that you do now. <laughs> <have. laughs> um, and and you, in addition to the public humanities, in addition to the academic work, you've also done curatorial work um, that is really interesting that I want you to talk about a little bit. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so I, I had the opportunity to curate a few shows at Harvard. And I, I used my Digital Humanities project as a, a point of departure um, for both of these shows. Um, mm -hmm. The first was a show that I titled Slavery in the Hands of Harvard. And the idea behind that show was that I was exploring Harvard University's connection to slavery and the slave trade. But my way of doing it was to take pieces from its permanent collection that had some relationship to slavery. And I paired those pieces with the work of contemporary artists whose work grapple with the legacy of slavery in some way. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, I took an archival document of a tuition bill that was paid for with casks of sugar. Mm -hmm. And the student who paid for um, his tuition with casks of sugar came from a sugar planting family. And I paired that with a reproduction of Carol Walker's sugar baby installation. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the idea behind that show. And I, there were several artists who um, graciously contributed pieces. Um, Nona Faustine, who's a Brooklyn-based artist. Noel um, Anderson contributed, cre actually he created a piece for that show. Mm -hmm. um, Renee Cox, um, who was an amazing first fashion photographer, then she became an artist. And the second show was uh, two solo shows by the historian and artist Nell Irving Painter, who is a very esteemed historian who taught at Princeton University for several decades. Her specialty is African American history. She also wrote a book, a New York Times bestseller called The History of White People. Mm -hmm. When she retired, she went back to school and she went to Rutgers and got a degree in art from Rutgers and she did an MFA at RISD. And she documented those experiences in a memoir called Olden Art School. And Olden Art School was the point of departure for two shows that I curated of her work at Harvard. One focused on her self-portraits. And the second show um, focused on a series of work that she did that sort of reimagined cartographies of race. And that one was titled Odalis Atlas. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a lot of fun working with her. Yeah, I, I um, often think about that title when I go to school. Uh, <laughs> I title myself old in grad school. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, so you had those really like incredible opportunities to not only collaborate with a lot of really interesting creative people, but also creating space for those people where there was not space for them before. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, you know, Nell Irving Painter is quite esteemed and she, she, she has quite a name, but she's still making a name for herself as an artist. People think of her more as a historian mm -hmm. and as an author. So I was interested in engaging with her as an artist. In a lot of ways, I think of myself as being a creative person. I'm not an artist and I'm not a designer by any means. I barely have any technical skills, but um, it was nice working with someone who, you know, has a PhD in history and is also a creative person, but is in, in a different point in their career. So um, I, was, I was really inspired working with Dr. Painter. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, another, like, again, you do so many different, like, really interesting things. They kind of all interconnected, but they're 
different aspects of, of the same thing, I think. Um, um, I wanted to talk about the fashion and justice workshop, mm. which I, you know, had the privilege to participate in two of them. And uh, I want you to talk, ab to introduce it a little bit, and then I'll ask you a few questions about it. Of course, yeah. So the Fashion and Justice Workshop is an ongoing workshop series that I co-founded and co-run with my friend and colleague, Kimberly Jenkins, who's at Ryerson University. And it's essentially, an, a scholar referred to it as a, a traveling thought exhibition. <laughs> so it's essentially uh, a, a series of lectures and workshops that we typically run um, over the course of a single day. The first one we did at Parsons, and then we did another one at, I've always, we've done so many now. I think we've done about five of them, so I forget the exact order, but we did another one in Austin at a gallery in Austin, and then we did another one at Columbia College, and we did one at Bard Graduate Center, and then we also did one, um, uh, what we call the Fashion and Justice Junior at um, your son's school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, to me, like, really speaks to your ability to educate in so many different ways. Um, and it was really, um, it was really an interesting experience uh, for me to see you talk to the kids and how like the pool of fashion, I would want to call it, like the, this idea that, you know, there's, is, there's something very easy about fashion to engage and connect with. And, and what you do in the workshop is really showing um, whether it's young students or it's just anyone who wants to participate. When I, I went to another workshop, I brought a friend who's not in fashion and there were, there were other people there who are not necessarily fashion people or scholars or just ordinary people who want to be educated about what they wear, um, where it's coming from. And I think there's something about this accessibility through the garment, through thinking about fashion, and again, going back to representation, which I think is is another kind of piece of it that you you bring into the workshop. So I want you to describe a little bit what, what happens uh, in those workshops. Yeah, and, and just to go to your point, like I think one thing that Kim and I are trying to do in the workshop is help redefine what fashion is. You know, for a lot of people when they hear fashion, they think of like, you know, high end, you know, couture houses in Europe. And they don't think about the actual clothes that mm -hmm. they're wearing. And we sort of try to break it down to like everyday experience. So normally at the Fashion and Justice Workshop, we have prepared lectures that we deliver um, I often do a lecture on my work on fashion and slavery. Kim will do a lecture on her work on fashion and race. But we often do hands-on activities. For example, we'll have participants think about the clothes that they wore to the workshop, where it's made, you know, where they buy it, do they know who made the clothes, how they're going to dispose of the clothes once they're done wearing it. Um, so that's one exercise that we have participants do. What Another, surprises you about what people, the people's reactions? You know, peop, we, we don't really think critically about the clothes that we're wearing. Um, we think about maybe how we're styling our bodies or what look, what's flattering, but we don't think about the best way to dispose of clothes. Uh, and that, that's always surprising. Um, it's something I think about all the time, but I think, you know, often for participants, it's a revelation that, you know, textiles can be recycled or that, you know, put, throwing clothes in like a random donation bin, it actually isn't great for the environment. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that surprises me most, actually. Often, another thing that surprises me, and, that, and this is not just for the Fashion and Justice Workshop, but this is just my work in general, people are often taken aback by me pairing the fashion industry with the legacy of slavery 
or the history of slavery, that's a revelation for a lot of people. In fact, some people would even call it an intervention. When people think about mm -hmm. slavery, they're not thinking about the word fashion, which is about, you know, freedom or the choice to wear what you want to wear or, you know, liberty. Um, so those are two things that, that are always things that for me have become like pretty pedestrian every day that, mm -hmm. is, that are always a surprise for people. It's interesting because if you think about it, then sort of like that's the, maybe the success and the legacy of the, um, the institution of slavery. If we don't connect those two things, then, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's then, you know, if, if that is the legacy, then that kind of shows you the problem and how deep that institution ran um, and how obscure it was in that way. Um, and what I mean by that, it's like, it was not, it, 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 they were able to disconnect how the cloth is or where the cloth is coming from. Um, and and kind of linking that to the fashion and justice um, idea, I think it's very not exactly the same way, but there are parallels in how we think about fashion today that it's really hard to understand because it's so far removed um, mm -hmm. how sometimes fashion is made in a very um, exploitive way. Um, so I think just may maybe even making those historic historical connections could maybe you know, allow us to spark contemporary conversations as well about how and who makes our clothes. Um, and what is even, you know, in, in terms of like, you know, we talk about child labor, it, it's really hard to understand that. It's really hard to grasp what that means when you're only thinking about it in historical um, context. But then when you're faced with the fact that, for example, if you have um, a blouse and it's made in India and it has little beads, um, most likely it's a little child who um, embroidered those beads. So even being aware to, like you said, the materiality, the experience, I think, and connecting all of those um, you know, traditions, unfortunately, of the fashion, of the fashion industry. Absolutely. And I mean, one of the things that I um, often think about is this ongoing debate about definitions of what fashion is. And, you know, for me, what fashion is, I think of it as being a slither of capitalism, which is probably a controversial statement for some, some fashion mm -hmm. scholars. But I think of it as... If you think about fashion as being a slither of capitalism, then you understand that fashion, one, is rooted in coerced labor and it continues to be rooted in coerced labor. Um, and I think one thing that one one thing that I'm trying to do and one thing that I know you're trying to do is sort of restore the dignity of human labor, to restore the value on human labor, to restore the value to makers of fashion. Yeah. So totally. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, so um, are you working on any exciting future projects? I am. Yes. I'm working on a book manuscript that will not be out soon <laughs> in two, three, four years, but a, a book that's essentially on um, fashion and slavery. And um, mm -hmm. each chapter, in a lot of ways, will stand alone. There's a chapter on, for example, Brooks Brothers, um, which is um, was founded over 200 years ago, and its connection to slavery. There's a chapter on, and I already mentioned this, um, head wraps worn by free and enslaved women of color. There's another chapter on W.E.D. Du Bois in his self-styling. Mm -hmm. I also have a chapter on Negro cloth, which is a textile that was made specifically for enslaved peoples. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on that book project. I'm continuing to work on fashioning the self and slavery and freedom, which is an, you know, my ongoing mm -hmm. digital humanities project. I post on a platform, I don't Instagram or Facebook, literally on a daily basis. So that's, mm -hmm. that's something that's not going in, going away. Awesome. I also have a magazine that I um, 
-hmm. work on that's inspired by fashioning the self and slavery and freedom it has the same title mm -hmm. fashioning the self and slavery and freedom and the second issue is in the process of coming out as we speak um it's laid out it's it, i sent it to the printer so if anyone's watching who bought a copy you should be getting your copy shortly <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> and i plan on having a um a zoom launch party for that one yeah and i'm actually have the th second issue took so long. I've actually started on the third issue. Mm -hmm. And the third issue is actually going to be printed on industrial textile waste. Uh, and it can be, and you can, you can use the, the issue as like a, a curtain or a tablecloth or a picnic cloth or a scarf or what have you. I'm printing it on muslin. I love it. <laughs> I can't wait to get mine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jonathan, thank you so, so much for joining me and chatting with me. It's always a pleasure. Oh my gosh, it's already over? I could have talked to you for like another hour. Me wow, too. okay. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Well, we'll, we'll continue offline um, for now. But um, again, thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, and I know that I will continue to obsessively follow you. Um, and your work. Well, thank you so much for having me. I always enjoy chatting with you. So we'll, we'll continue the conversation and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. So thank you so much for- Thank you. And thank you for anyone who's wa who watches, watches this video. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you.